Hello, I'm Jacob Kilbride, and I'm delighted to say that I'm joined today by bare knuckle boxer Scott Midgley. Uh, Scott, first of all, thanks for your time. Really appreciate you coming down. Um, Scott, um, just talk to me a little bit about about your career, Scott. We were just talking sort of off recording. You know, you've been in the the bare knuckle game for for ten years now. Um, just talk to me. Uh, just just explain to people who, who don't know who you are who you are basically. I'm um, I'm the former English bare knuckle champion. Um, I'm also f- I've just fought for um, the light heavyweight British title as well. Um, got a few fights this year. I got into bare knuckle many years ago. Um, obviously, it's not as big as what it is now. It were uh, more seedy and more underground back then. It's uh, obviously grown a lot over the f- last few years. Mm. That's when obviously part of my assignment is looking at sort of why it's grown and how how it's growing. Where do, why do you sort of feel that it has sort of gone from? Like we were saying, sort of off recorded from from the bands and you know the scenes from Snatch to to now selling out, uh, you know, a couple uh, of I thousand feet of It's, it's just more a primal thing with humans, you know. We, we just we love the more brutal side of it. The more brutal a fight is, I don't know why we do. Maybe it's the old cavemen things, but it's like I used to say to people, you know, you go to watch football. I'm a lead supporter, so if I were going to watch Leeds United play football, you know, I mean, I'm in stand. I've paid, you know, forty quid to go and watch my team play, but if the fight breaks out in the crowd I'm not going to watch my team play football I'm actually going to turn and watch the fight you know even though I've just paid to come and watch football if a fight breaks out in crowd we're going to turn I don't care who you are whether you're a man woman child you all turn to watch a fight I don't know what it is Mm. something excites us the more raw it is the more I don't know it's just a primal thing yeah how many fights would you would you say that you've had sort of uh, as as a bare knuckle fighter in sort Um, of I think legal bare knuckle ones I've had I think I'm 19 now, 19 bare knuckle fights. Right. Obviously, we've had many more that are not legal, yeah. but sanctioned and legal ones. I think I'm on 19. Okay. And as a rough estimate as to sort of including the ones that maybe weren't licensed and that type of thing? I couldn't, couldn't, honestly, couldn't. I'd, it's hard to count just them 19, but I've had a lot. A lot. A lot, a lot. Um, just talk to me a little bit about, about your early life then and childhood and that type of thing <coughs> it was was fighting you know, sort of always um, always to be fair I've, I've had a decent childhood i've got two great parents what stayed married um they only left each other when i were an adult um so i had, I had two great parents i grew up on a rough estate in bradford called buttershaw um but again to me it's, it wasn't rough because it's all we all we knew um yeah i was a bit of a bit of scally when i was younger but i wasn't really a, a bad lad um I, I did love a little fight because i've got older cousins but Again, I'm, I want an idiot. Um, so I had a good childhood. At 16, leaving school, I joined Army. And I think that really made me into a man then. I I'd, I'd joined Army at 16. And within a few months, I turned from a 16-year-old boy into a 16-year-old man, mm. you know, very early. And they, they did a great job, did Army. I stayed at Army five years, obviously travelling around doing what I did with them. Inside the army, it's it's a lads it's a lads world. It's a man's world. You know, we live by his own rules. We you know we're disciplined by his own people, and having a fight really wasn't that bad. You know, it's just a way to settle disputes. So having a fight on a Saturday or a Friday night with other soldiers who didn't agree with what you were saying, it wasn't really a bad thing. Obviously, we get punished and get thrown on guard duty, but it wasn't a bad thing. Mm. And then leaving army, I think I still had that mentality, you know, instilled inside me where if someone pissed me off, they've got a cracking mouth. Mm. And I know we can't do that in society these days as, you know, laws and judges and courts what say we can't, but it was still instilled in me. So I did get into a few fights, and I, but I did I did grow up a lot. And um, I think the, re- the reason that I got into bare knuckle, there was something still burning inside me after leading the army. I knew how talented I was as a fighter. There's no doubt about that. You know, I, I'd never, I'd never lost a fight in my life on the sh- on the streets. I still am on the streets. Um, I knew how good I was. I didn't want to uh, turn professional boxer because I'd just get schooled by these young lads who would just run rings around me. They wouldn't even, they wouldn't get engaged into a fight. They'd just outpoint me and win rounds. So I didn't really want to turn down the boxing route. I didn't want to go into MMA because, again, you know, the, the jiu-jitsu guys and the ground the ground game were far advanced to what I was. I just wanted a stand-up fight. And if I had gone into MMA, yeah, if they had a stand-up fight with me, chances are I'd knock most of them out. But as soon as it went to ground, you know, they'd bend my fingers, bend my toes, bend, you know, whatever <laughs> they can. And I wouldn't have a... Because I'm not trained in that discipline, I wouldn't have a clue how to get out of it. So I didn't want to get, sh- again, shown up by someone who'd never beat me in a, in a one-on-one fight. 
and I kind of I kind of just fell in at bare knuckle side. One of my friends showed me a video once, and um, he says, "Oh, you think you're tough? Watch these two. So he showed me this video, and it was on YouTube, and I watched these two guys, and they just battered hell out of each other for seventeen and a half minutes, just so, just solid seventeen and a half minutes. They were cheap bronze broke, eye sockets broke. Uh, they were they were a right mess after, but I watched them. And I thought, Jesus Christ, these are two hardest guys I've ever known. Mm. One of them were actually from Huddersfield. He's called Dave Radford. Ah, right. He's retired now. Um, he ended up being one of my idols right. and a, a good you know mentor and role model to me. The other one was uh, is now one of my closest friends, James McCrory. And uh, I just thought, God, these two are just tough. You know that that's that's what I want to get into. And um, I think about six months later, I showed my other friend this the same video. I'd been watching that video, you know, probably a hundred times. I couldn't stop watching it. I thought, wow. And I showed one of my friends, and my friend says, "Oh, I know the guy who runs these shows." I'm like, "What do you mean a show? When it's just two guys on a fight in a pub?" <laughs> he says, "No, no. What they've done is they've met. You know, they've got artist guys from round country. You know, he's artist guy from Newcastle. He's artist guy from Yorkshire." And you know they wanted to see what's the hardest guy in Britain is, and the the meet up and they have these fights. It's like a you know it's like a fight club. And were these in pubs? I'm guessing. And that's yeah, like, that um, sort of pubs, venues, back yeah. gardens, barns. They were doing it all over. Yeah. You, you name anywhere it. And everywhere. Yeah, yeah they'd, they'd try it anywhere. It's, you know, just anywhere with room. And uh, so I watched. I thought, this is my cup of tea. So the guy who says I, he knows that who puts them on, he got in, he got me in touch with a guy called Andy, um, who I'm still good friends with now. And uh, I messaged him. I said, look, you know, I'm interested in it, but um, I want to come and have a look at it, you know, see what situation is first before I, I dip my toes in it. It's like, yeah, this is, there's a, a, a transatlantic title fight in London. Um, it's in a gangster's back garden in Lon- you know, down in London. I thought, oh, great. And it was in, a, obviously, the famous gangster Dave Courtney. It, it was in his back garden. Now, me and Dave are very, very close friends now. We've been on holiday together, but at the time I didn't know him. But I knew I knew of his reputation. I actually read all his books, mm. so I thought, oh, what am I doing here? You know, I'm going out of London in someone's back garden, and uh, just me and my friend drove down from Bradford, drove out of London, and um, there were I think there were about four or f- four or five fights in in someone's back garden. They'd set it all up quite professionally, and uh, there were like a few fights early on, and then James turned up late as usual. I think he was a, a bit hungover from the night before, if I'm honest. And they'd flown an American over, and um, James ended up knocking him out cold, and won transatlantic title. And after that, I pulled Andy up. There were, you know, there were Freddie Foreman there, who were associates of Craze, they were full of gangsters and hard men. I pulled Andy up, and I says, "Tell you what, mate, says, get me up next show. I want to beat all these." And that's it. I went up next show. So you weren't you were nervous or scared at that? You you seemed I was to, intrigued. Seemed to enjoy I, that, yeah. I was very intrigued. I, I'd watched it, and I'd, I'd, I just watched them all, and I thought I'd beat every single one of these. I really, I really believed it in my head. I thought I'd beat them all, and um, I just, I just fancied it. And he says, "Right, he says I'll, I'll have you on next show." Mm. Put my name down. Went on next show, and that was it. Mm. That, that's sort of very, a very confident attitude, and sort of from speaking to you for only ten minutes, that's sort of a perception I get of you. Sort of someone who's quite a confident individual. Is I've, I've always been confident. I've always been confident in my ability, but I've not been cocky. You know, I do know that any man can be knocked out. Mm. You know, although I've never been close to being knocked out myself, I know I, ca- I could be. If, you know, if I've been it right, definitely. So in my head, I think I just believe every man on this planet has the capability to knock another man out, but also every man has the ability to be knocked out. Mm. So I'm confident in my ability as a fighter, but I also know the limits as a human body. You know, you can only take so much. Yeah. What was it sort of, if you could sort of pinpoint one thing that sort of appealed to you about bare knuckle boxing, is there any sort of one aspect of it that, that appealed to you? Just the toughness. Yeah, yeah, like we, we we know the most skillful boxers are. You know, we we'll watch them on TV. Mm. The, you know, the best boxers in the world are the ones we watch. So I won't try to compete with my boxing level compared to theirs because I know my boxing level is a a, mi- a minor compared to theirs. You know, we've got some great boxers from Bradford. You know, and if I step in a boxing ring with them and have a boxing match, I'm going to get schooled. But if they step in a bare knuckle fight with me, chances I'm going to knock them out. You know, it's a different different sort of fight. You know, we we'll, look. We all we all like looked like to look that way and go who's hardest guy this and who's toughest this and we'll get an MMA guy and we'll get a boxer and we'll get you know a jujitsu guy and we'll get a karate guy and we're like who's the hardest well it's we don't know unless they have 
the same sort of fight. Mm. They're the best in their own sport, in their own aspect. So if I jump in an MMA ring as tough as I am, I'm going to get submitted. Yeah. That chances are they're just going to take me down and submit her, you know. So them winning that right does not mean they're tougher than me, but mm. it have just means I'm, my level skill is not on theirs. Yeah. Have you had sort of any sort of boxing training or in, in an amateur bo- setup or anything like that? I used to box for army a little bit. Um, again, I, would, I would only army five years, and I never took it serious. It was just I was just a young lad. And I got in there and I, would, I thought I was decent to be honest. I, I never lost. Was it just training or were we having... No, no, but yeah, we have yeah, yeah, plenty of boxing match matches with yeah. loads, yeah. Um, but again, their level of training, so and this is no disrespect to any army boxers because we've got some great boxers. Um, a good friend of mine, Kevin Bennett, who was an army boxing champion and ended up being a, a British boxing champion and right. ended up being a world bare-knuckle champion. Ah, okay. So uh, his, his level <coughs> shows that the British Army, you know, can teach it decent, but the bo- the, you know, the coaches in the British Army, they're not on the same level as, you know, the Olympic boxing coaches out here, mm. and plus, you know, we don't do it as long, so my my level of boxing skill was quite low when we are in there, but we just went in there, we're just two guys having a fight, really, yeah. with gloves on, <laughs> that's the way we used to treat it. Um, we sort of stopped your sort of story about, about the time where you were... Uh, you'd said you wanted to be on the next show, so how, talk to me a little bit about that that first experience of yeah. Bit, so and how, how did it all come about? I spoke to Andy, Andy Topley, who um, he were he run the shows at the time, and I said, look, get me on next show. I went, I'll beat all these. I went, I'll show you a real fighter. And again, that's that was no disrespect to lads that were on show because obviously my mate James was on the show and he's one of the best out there. But I, re- I genuinely believed I could I had the ability to knock every single one of them out. I ended up fight. I ended up fighting one of the guys what were on that show later on in life ended up beating him and knocking him out so kind of proved my point <laughs> but um i just said it one day i said just get me on next show i went i'll show you a real fighter i says you know th- these are not real fighters th- that in my eyes that at the time that's what i thought i thought th- these are not real fighters these are just tough game lads i'm going to show you a, a serious fighter he said right get on next show so i think the next show we were supposed to fight in a stadium in hinkley it got cancelled, police raided it, because obviously at the time we didn't have proper licensing. Mm. Kept getting raided, then we were going to fight in the gangster's back garden again, that got raided and stopped. Kept getting prolonged and prolonged, and then we sorted a venue out, uh, well, like, it wasn't a venue, it was just a barn, um, in Hollyhead in Wales. So I drove, I think about five and a half hours from Bradford to Hollyhead. Or I drove myself as well, right. so oh. I and then we were supposed to have a fight. Just you on your own? Or no, my, my friend Brendan right. came with me. Um, two of my friends already met me, met me there as well, my dad and my uh, mate Anthony, but Bre- it was just me and Brendan, uh, Brendan Donoghue from Bradford. We just drove down ourselves, and we were just having a laugh all the way down, and we were driving up these dirt tracks, middle of nowhere, it absolutely took ages to find, and then we were driving up the dirt track, all I could see at top was this huge barn, and we've had 200 gypsies stood outside, and my mate Brendan, who's... You know, he's not from the same world as me. We're from the same estate, but he's, he lives a, a decent life. He looks at me, he goes, Scott. Lives in the posh part, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's like, Scott, what the hell are we doing here? I said, I've just come for a fight, mate. And um, I turned up, went in there, spoke to all travellers and, you know, everyone else were there. And my per- my original opponent didn't turn up. So I was fuming. You know, I've just drove five and a half hours. So I kicked off with promoter. I said, look, I says, this is out of order, you know, what, 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 what we're going to do here, I'm, you know, I've just drove five and a half hours, he goes, well, you can jump in the ring and call anyone out and, you know, hopefully someone will fight you, I want you what? We had James Quinn McDonough, who's, you know, king at gypsies, uh, there's a documentary on him called Knuckle, he were there with all, you know, a lot of his fa- his family and friends, he had uh, Bobby Gunn, who's bare knuckle champion of America, mm. he were there. He had my friend Steve Miller, who was, you know, like six foot nine, twenty odd stone, giant of a man. You know, we, he had some serious, serious hard men that were there. I thought, ah, oh, nothing. So what? And um, I jumped in anyway. Jumped in the ring, got microphone, and I turned around. I says, any man can go one round with me. I'll give you five hundred quid. I said, you don't have to beat me. You've just got to last five, uh, one round. Mm. You don't have to beat me. Just last one round, and you get five hundred quid. So I'm looking around and there were apps, there were loads there, about 250 people there all together. And I knew there were some top level fighters and not one fighter stepped up. So I'm a little bit pissed off and um, I jumped out at ring and then my mate called me. He says, Scott, you've got an opponent. I turned around 
and this mad Scotsman ripped his shirt off, stood there with his jeans and his t-shirt, uh, jeans and his trainers on. He says, I'll fight you. You know, tattoos all over him. Like a proper scene out of Snatch. You know, yeah. absolutely. it's on YouTube. I've got it on my, my Facebook as well, the video. And I just looked, I walked over to him and I just looked at him. I went, are you sure about this, mate? Because I'd, tra- I'd been training for about eight weeks for this. So this was like me at my fittest. Right. I said, you sure about this? He goes, yeah. He says, I'm up for a fight against anyone. I went, all right, mate. Didn't say I didn't warn you. And um, I think I ended up kicking off with someone in the crowd just before we fought as well. Someone was saying something. I think they called me um, boy band or something like that. <laughs> get little. Bo- I think they said, get little boy band out. That's your nickname, isn't it? Pretty boy. Well, pretty boy's my nickname, but yeah. at the time, yeah, we were getting called all sorts, you know, like in boy zone and in one direction and all sorts. Because I got obviously I got blonde highlights, and um, so I turned around a guy who was shouting, you know, taking piss out of me. I said, I'll tell you what, once I finish with this guy, I said, you're next, and you can see me in video kicking off with him. And then um, obviously bell rent, and I beat the guy in 34 seconds. Just just set the scene for us, just so I can sort of visually picture well, it. What, what what was the venue like? So the the whole th- like the barn itself, or like one of them, um, what they call them, you know, where they do. Um, is it equestrian with horse riding? Ah, yeah, yeah. It yeah. Would, so that right. the, that's like the barn. So it was all like um, soil and sand. Um, the ring was made out of hay bales. So it was like nine foot by nine foot or ten foot by ten foot. Yeah. Solid um, hay bales. Um, so that was the ring. You know, it was like a serious scene out of Snatch. Um, so again, in ten foot by ten foot, there's no way to use your boxing skill. There's no way to use f- yeah. foot movement. There's no way to get it. Right. It's just a you know, toe to toe brawl, which obviously it's ideal for me, is that. Um, and then you had just 200 and odd people surrounding it. Police actually turned up to that one. Ah, right. And let it, let it continue because we were on private land at the time and there were no dis. They actually turned up and they were, I, I was watching them dance, you know, because we had a DJ there. Yeah. And they were, you know, playing music and some cops were actually dancing. <laughs> they, were, they were enjoying it. Um, and and they, did, in, they didn't say anything because. They were on private land. So right, at, okay. So at the time. Before all this, we used to get raided because we, we used to put them on pu- public um, public, public lands. Yeah. Now, bare knuckle boxing's never been illegal, and we we fought it for last hundred years that it were illegal, but it's never been illegal. We changed over from the l- old London prize fighting rules, which were the old bare knuckle rules, mm-hmm. to the Queensbury rules, which yeah. is the modern day boxing, boxing yeah. rules today. We just changed over; we didn't outlaw it. So, because we've not done that for ages, you know, and it's been a hundred odd years. You know, since that were legal, the modern people just think oh, that got outlawed because in America it's it's illegal, but in the UK it never was illegal. So, if two guys were to have a fight now in the street and no one presses charges, you get done for public order. It's because you're on public land. Yeah. Unless one presses charges, then you get done for assault. But if no one presses charges, you only get done for public order. It's because you're on public land again. There's actually no law against two men having a fight, a consented fight. There's no law against it, mm. as long as it's on private land. And one of our old fighters, Seth Jones, he was a practicing solicitor at the time, and he looked into it, and he's like, look, there's no law against it. So we took it in front of a judge, and we says, look, how do we make this into a sport? And it's the oldest sport in the world, but it's not a recognised sport. Mm. How do we make it into a sport? So the judge went away, did his own work, come back, and he says, look, I, says, I can't find out. He says, there's no law against it. He says, if you want to do it, let's do it right. He says, you're going to do it no matter what. You're going to do it in barns, back gardens, yeah. back lanes. He says, we know you're going to do it. We know you do it. So let's do it properly and get it legal and get, you know, medics there, doctors there, you know, as, as safe as we can for the public and the fighters. So, right. So the, the judge says, you need competitors first, which you've got. You need rules. You need a sanctioning body outside the people what are setting it up. So, you know, like, Mm. It's f- that, that's basically for betting, really. I think right. you know. So if one, you want to bet on a fight, you know, yeah. if there's no sanctioning body, then people can just just the regulator fight. into yeah. It. yeah. yeah. Right. Um, it says you'll need medics. Get absolutely, you know, it's a combat sport, so you've got to have medics on site, um, and you're going to need security. Apart from that, you know, you know, all right. And as long as there's an entertainment license or some sort of boxing license on private property. Uh, it's got to be private, but so we can't have it on public land either. Mm. It's got to be, you know, we can't have it in a, in a park. Yeah. Um, 
and that was it. So and that's how we started from there. Mm. Just before we sort of move on to talk about it becoming sort of licensed and, and regulated and those types of things, just wanted to touch on sort of the, the underground scene a little bit more. Um, how how old were you at the time when you sort of first first started, and, and how long did you sort of spend in, in that scene? Um, the bare, bare knuckle scene. I've been around about ten years. Um, this, I've been around this side where it it's, it was still underground. But we'll try to t- turn it mainstream for the last five or six years, um, and th- there was always been talks of it going mainstream. We always wanted to go mainstream, but it was we didn't have the power, we didn't have the means, we didn't have the know-how or knowledge of how to do it really. Mm. So it were always underground. Then you know, again, we, we were doing it in pubs, we were doing it in clubs, we were doing it in back gardens, bands, and you know, you watch films like Snatch, you know, and you think oh, that don't go on. Trust me, what we were doing were ten times worse than that. There's no, no two ways about it. You know, I watched. Um, I'm a big Emmerdale fan. I used to watch Emmerdale when Zach used to do his bare knuckle and, and that sort of one. He, it was just recently done it, where they used to have hay bales and they basically copied what we used to do. That's exactly how we used to do it. We'd just find a place somewhere, we'd put hay bales down, tell people. We'd, we didn't even tell them the location on the day. You know, it still happens to this day, it happened over a week. You know, you get given the location on the day and you turn up, buy your ticket on the day, you know. It is it was very underground, you know. My first one, like I say, we're in a gangster's back garden, you know, there were legit murderers there. You know, like I say Freddie Foreman who were associates with Craze, he were there, you know, I met him. I, I was talking to Dave and I said to Dave, Dave Courtney and I said to Dave, I said, Do you know something? I'm really shocked at how polite and how nice everyone here is. You know what it is, Scott? He says, you've got the most dangerous men in the country all in one place here. He says, you've got legit gangsters who have killed people. He says, and you've got the hardest men in the country here. He says, the gangsters don't want to mess with hard men because they'll get knocked out. Mm. The hard men don't want to mess with gangsters because they'll get shot tomorrow. He says, so it's just a mutual respect everyone has. And, you know, I had people coming up to me, introducing themselves, you know, going out of the way to introduce themselves to me to find out where I was from, you know, what made me get into it and what made me come and watch it. And everyone was just so lovely. Mm. And, you know, and that went on for years and years and I was so shocked at it. I'm like, wow, you know, the v- I've only ever noticed two kickoffs in a crowd at, at all the shows I've been on. I've really? been on probably 40 or 50 different shows. Right. And I've o- I only remember two. One of them wasn't really anything. We're just Welsh getting a little bit drunk. Um, and another one was in Bolton, but just two little kickoffs. That's yeah. it. You go to any standard MMA, fa- um, you know, crowd or a boxing crowd. But boxing worse at the moment. They're always kicking off in boxing mm. shows. Yeah, you know, there's always some sort of little kickoff. But uh, fi- you know, up to fifty shows I've been to bare knuckle side. I've only ever noticed two. Yeah. So it's very, it's very, very polite and well, ma- well mannered. Mm. Um. In terms of sort of going from that scene to the to the license scene, then did you encounter encounter a lot of problems with that, or sort of after the judge sort of passed that decision, was it sort of? The, yeah, there's been all sorts of problems, but again, it's a new sport. You you're gonna find problems, and you're gonna nurse these little things that you. It's all a learning curve, you know. As big as the what we've got now, and as much money as we're getting at these shows, you know, we're bringing four and a half thousand people easily to these shows, um, and then that's. We're also on pay per view. It's going worldwide as well. So we also get, you know, got the pay per view viewings. But we're, we're all for the next few years. We're gonna get hiccups and we're gonna see things what go, don't go right. Judging's not quite at standard, you know, because we'll bring in MMA judges and boxing judges, and they're not watching an MMA fight or a or a boxing match. They're wearing a be- they're not watching a bare knuckle. So we need to try and. This is my view anyway. We need to try and find, you know, maybe retired bare knuckle fighters who can sit and go. Uh, understands an actual bare knuckle fight and what it takes to be in a bare knuckle fight rather than someone from a different sport. Yeah. Same with the, with the referees as well. We've got some great referees. You know, a friend of mine, Sean Smith. You know, one of the best referees out there. There's Big Baz, One Eyed Baz. He's a great referee. Um, but again, I, I just think we need bare knuckle referees and bare knuckle judges and. Mm. Stuff like that, but again, there's not many old school bare knuckle fighters out there. Yeah, because it's such a such a new. Yeah, new sport, it yeah. is. It's yeah. it's just exploded. The, the, there will be the, your old traveller ones out there, but again, even your old traveller bare knuckle fights are different to what ours are because the, some of theirs can last over an hour in a back lane, Jesus. and there's only been twenty punches thrown, you know, in the last twenty minutes. 
you know, you, you watch them on YouTube and half them, what, are now along the boring. It's no disrespect to them because I can't bloody jog for, you know, 40-odd mm -hmm. minutes, never mind fight. You know, that that's just their endurance. But there's not many punches being thrown, whereas that, what we do, it's just a, it's just a fight. Mm. Um, just off recording, you mentioned about some sort of podcast, um, not podcast, sorry, documentaries you've been involved with. In. Yeah. Um, I was watching the, the Netflix documentary as well, the Bare Knuckle Fight yeah. Club. You, you were on that one. Uh, we were texting before, you were on a, one with Vice as well, is that right? Yeah, I've, there's uh, Vice have done one, um, Channel 4's done one, BBC have done a couple, Netflix, the one on Netflix, obviously that's big, that, that's something like uh, 100 million views. Yeah, I think, I think it was initially on Channel 4 and then Netflix have bought it. Yeah, well, what, think, yeah. yeah what it was is... Um, it was supposed to be just Channel 4, and I think then Channel 4 sold it to Netflix right. to make a free part. And I've heard in America is seven parts to it, you know, ah, okay. rather than the free ones, what you've seen on Netflix. Yeah. In America, there's seven, I think. Um, so there, there should be more yeah. of me on there as well. Um, yeah. Just in, in terms of the Netflix one, because that's the one that I've sort of mainly watched. I, obviously, um, sort of recording you at home and, 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 and in your fights and training, how did you feel that you were represented? Is it fair, fair representation? Well, that, like, they... they they film for months, actually filming for about nine months. Filmed you for nine yeah. months? Yeah. Right. So wow. obviously what we're, what they're putting there is a tiny, tiny clip of all, the, you know, they're the filming in different fights, they're filming in training camps, they're filming going over all over the country, they film filming kids, you know, my, me at work, they fil the filmed all my, you know, my ex-girlfriend at the time, they filmed all sorts of... Although that's it was great publicity what I've got and I got you know was it a bit massive credit for it. Sorry, go on. But it's uh, the film for ages and um, the whole nine month where I was filmed, I did think I represented myself quite well. Um, I, tr I tried making it less bloody and less brutal as what I could, even though that's what it is. Mm. You know, it is what it is. You know, but I tried my best to go. Look, we're getting away from the gangster side. We're getting away from the back gardens. We're getting away from the barns. We're trying to take it in at these, you know, big stadiums now, and I'll try to show people that. And obviously, because I'm well spoken, quite intelligent, and I'm, you know, good representative of the sport itself. I, I thought I did it well. Mm. And obviously, when they're filming you for that amount of time, I suppose it's not like a, a ten minute thing, is it? Where you can sort of be fake and put on lines and well, that. Well, this it's, is what it's I said. Very to genuine. Them. Yeah, I said, I said when the agreement. They were supposed to film just Sean. That was the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, he's it, the centrepiece, isn't it he? Was, yeah, yeah, it was supposed to be not to do with bare knuckle. But he was my trainer at the time with Sean. So I was going over to Warrington and training over there. And he introduced me. He says, look, he says, this is a at the time I went number one in country. Number one contender in country. I went number two in the world in middleweight. Right. Uh, ranked in bare knuckle. He says, so Sean introduced me to the Channel 4 guys. He says, oh, this is Scott Midgley. He's fighting for first world title in 137 years. You know, sanctioned, mm. the first ever sanctioned world. I was fighting a guy from America called Billy Martin, undefeated champion of America. So they're like, what do you mean? <laughs> They'd seen me a few times, but they didn't know that I was a fighter. They just thought I'd go to Sean's gym and would just train. They what do you mean? He's fighting for a bare knuckle title. He's the first guy in 130 odd years to fight for a legitimate sanctioned bare knuckle title in the UK. So, like, they come on, they introduce themselves, they're like, you know, this story sounds ace, you know. I think it was a better story than the original, what they had planned. And, right. like, you know, come with, you know, do some interviews with you and follow you a little bit. Like, I love publicity, me. I, I don't mind it. I love being <laughs> in newspapers, I love being in magazines. So, I'm like, yeah, of course you can. <laughs> Didn't know they were going to follow me for about nine months, but I enjoyed it. You know, the, the guys were great. They'd always let me know when they were coming up and when they were staying over and... What the, what they wanted to do, so I loved it. Mm. Was I loved it, not, it all. Was it not a little bit intrusive at times, or did you? Uh, I'm no? quite an open person. I'm, right. I'm okay. You know, my kids loved it. My kids are quite, you yeah. know, confident kids. Um, my girlfriend at the time, Joanne, that's my kids' mum. We're not together now, but we were at the time again. This was like four years ago. This was filmed. Right. Um, she's a bit shy, and she was. Yeah, didn't she, did, she didn't like getting interviewed too much because she didn't want to like screw up, but. I loved it. Uh, it didn't bother me at all. Mm. And again, the more people know about not just me but the sport itself. Like our old promoter used to, he didn't like us talking to newspapers. He says, "Look, they'll try and spin it any way they can to make it look as violent and as seedy and as, you know, as criminal as they can because it's a good story and it sells. You mm. know, and it, granted, if you put the tame version of bare knuckle in a paper and the violent." nasty side of bare knuckle the nasty side of always going to get more views it's always going to get more buys so I, I understand that from media side but in my the way I look at it I go look any publicity is good publicity because you've got two 
you've got the public out there, they've got half the public, some of the public what do know it happens, that's a small majority. Mm. You've got a big group of the public what will never agree with it. They'll always frown upon it. So they they're irrelevant anyway. No matter how you spin it, they're never gonna come to the show because they've already made the mind up. But then you've got another side what don't even know it happens. So when they find out that it's happening, they go, oh, I didn't even know that was going on. I definitely didn't know you could go and buy a ticket and watch it. So it opens a new, a, you know, more doors for mm. bigger venues. So I will, like, I'll speak to anyone, me. Yeah. Well, yeah, I loved it. I've been on American radio shows, American TV, um, all MMA new, uh, magazines, new, new uh, national newspapers. I love it all. Mm. TV, obviously. Uh, just in terms of the documentary as well, that one of the things they asked you, which I thought was sort of something that I probably should have asked fighters before and probably haven't done because it's sort of quite an obvious question, but it was just, why do you fight? Which I thought was quite a, quite just a, quite a uh, th- well, good a, and simple question. There's a story with me with how I got into bare knuckle. It's a personal one and I'll never, I'll never really open up properly about it, but I was going through a, t- a time in my life on my, per- my, private, my private side where it was just, it was, it was just my, you know, within my relationship and stuff like that, it wasn't really going right and things were happening and I just thought, I, I've always been a tough lad, I've always had a reputation, but at that time in my life I'd chilled out, I'd had kids, got a mortgage, had a good job, you know, and I just felt that people forgot who I was, who I used to be, you know, I did used to be this tough guy who had, who demanded respect because I was an idiot, but you know, back when I was younger and at that time in my life I just felt that a lot of people had forgotten that about me. And they were kind of taking the the piss a little bit, and it, it it like fell into my private life as well. And I had a choice here: either going around city, really doing some, you know, damage and hurting people, you know, or I had to find something else because I really were in a turmoil place, and I I, I think I were cracking up if I were honest. I really I was having a breakdown, and I were, I could end up killing someone. So I thought I need to do something, you know, to for myself. And to let people know, look, don't forget who I am. Mm. And I didn't want to get back into boxing because I'd not boxed for so many years after leaving army. And I'd just jump in a ring with some y- young kid who'd just win points and just run rings around me and just stay away from me. Yeah. I didn't want to get into MMA because, again, I'm I'm not a trained jiu-jitsuist. So unless you want to stand up and have a toe-to-toe with me, then I'd, it's in my favour. But as soon as it'd go to ground, obviously it'd go in their favour. So I didn't want someone bending my toe and... Getting getting a win over me or bend, by bending my toe, something silly mm. like that, and I, so I, f- I just fell into bare knuckle. I thought, well, was no it more manly than beating the crap out of another hard guy? Yeah, was it sort of um, sort of trying to think how to phrase it? Sort of like a, a release of frustration in yeah, a sense. Yeah, doubt. I yeah. had to. Yeah, I had to. There was something burning inside me. That's a fact. There was something burning inside me, and I, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, you know, my whole life I've been a man's man. You know, army fighting. You know, a bit, I was a bit of a lady, ladies boy as well. So I've always been a, like, a proper man's man. And at the time, I, I wasn't feeling it. I felt that I've like let myself just slip a little bit and got a little bit soft. So I had to show people that you know I, I still am what you all used to think I was. You know, you can't, you don't forget how to fight. I've always been a fighter. You don't forget how to fight. You just choose when and when the best place is to fight. Now, I'll fight for the right reasons now. And that's what I did. I grew up and I, I didn't used to fight for the silly reasons. I fought for reasons what I believed in. Mm. Um, so, yeah, there was something burning inside me and I had to unleash it somehow, get this frustration out and unleash it on someone else. And uh, while, while I was doing that, showing other people, look, you know, if I put my hands on you, you're screwed. Mm. Um, how many have you got children? Haven't you? Have you got two two daughters? Got two, right? two little girls. Yeah. How do you sort of explain your job to them? Do they? Do you, they I've got to play it naively to them. Obviously, they're, they're only young. Um, they they know what I do. They know they, they've seen a few of my fights, uh, which I, I didn't agree with. But I've been there or just on no, the no, video never, no, right. I won't take on them. But you 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 can't help YouTube in me. Yeah, yeah. As soon as you type my name into Google, it all comes up, and they do it at school. You know, the young, all the friends do it. Oh, is that your daddy? Is that your daddy? Mm. You know, that you can't help it. They've, they've got phones themselves. They've got tablets. So as soon as they type in my name or even their own name, the middle name comes up, and yeah. it'll show pictures of me or videos of me. So I couldn't get away from it. So all I, to them, I'm just a boxer. And I just do it without gloves. Yeah, that's just the way. That's just yeah. the best way I could explain it. Yeah, I'd, we'd, I just put. Yeah, I don't put them pillars on my hands, baby. Dad is tougher than that. I don't, he don't need her. You know, you just 
explain it the best way I can. Just look, you know, I'm a boxer just without gloves. Mm. Um, just sort of talking sort of more broadly about about the sport. Where, where do you sort of see sort of the the boxing, uh, the bare knuckle boxing sort of scene domestically at the moment? Do you feel it's in a in a uh, strong place? A few years ago, I just I thought we were going to stay a little bit un- underground and maybe just pop up into some shows now and again. Um, but it's just exploded over the last two or three years. It absolutely got massive. You know, I remember the first per- pay-per-view show, we, we, we were all on it. And it just, it, it, it you could, on the pay-per-view, so if the promoters, when they put the pay-per-view, you can see which countries have bought it. Right. And there were countries I've never even heard of. I'm like, <laughs> where are we? What, these guys from all over. And then I was getting messages on Facebook, you know, from guys all over the world. Oh, I watched your fight last night, mate. You're awesome. You know, you represented it well. I'm like... Who the hell's that guy? Where's he from? <laughs> you know, it's just crazy. But um, it's exploded so much, and to be honest, it's it's gonna get bigger and bigger. People always say, "Oh, look, it'll stop at one point." But they all said that about UFC. You mm. know, don't forget UFC were banned in most states in America. You know, only so many states it could go on, and it's now it's bigger than boxing. Is UFC without a doubt? You know, apart from your Mayweather, and you you know your. Maybe your Joshua's, you know, pulling in big numbers. Apart from that, your average boxing show does far less than most um, mm. UFC average, shows yeah. by standard. Mm. You know, they're, they're blowing them out of water. But 10 years ago, you'd have never in a million years thought it were even going to come close to competing with boxing, never mind being better. Mm. And this is what the, our promoter, my, our old promoter, said to me once. He says, look, he says, and this is exactly what Dana White said about UFC. He goes, look, I says, I don't think it'll be bigger than boxing, but maybe one day we could compete. And then my promoter said exactly the same thing, and I don't think he's a uh, UFC fan, to be honest, so it would just, it yeah. just stuck. He says, look, I don't think we're going to be as big as UFC, but I'd like to compete with them on, you know, on that mm. same level. And I, I just it just stuck with me. I thought, do you know, Dana White once said that 10 years ago, and look at him now, he's just sold it for 3.0 billion, whatever, yeah, he, yeah, whatever yeah, he's yeah, done. Yeah, crazy, right? So, uh, why, why do you think there is an appetite for it? Again, it's because it's raw. The more ra- the, the less rules you throw in, the more raw, the more blood can be spilled. It's just a primal instinct with us. We just lo- we love it, you know. We get we used to get bored of May- watching Mayweather, and we, most of us used to watch Mayweather just because we wanted to see him lose. We just wanted to, is mm. someone just going to beat him one day, like the same when we used to watch Nazim, you know. But we only appreciate him after the finish and go just how good they were, and. Um, I don't know, it's just the more that like Tyson, we love Tyson because he was an animal. He went in there to hurt you. Mm. That's that that was his agenda. He wanted to knock that head clean off your shoulders. And we loved watching him. We still love watching him to this day. You know, we will watch a Tyson fight any day of the week over a Mayweather fight. That's a fact. Because he was more aggressive. He was just pure violence. And it's the same with us, the more raw and more aggressive we are, and the more violence and more blood gets sh- shed, the better the fights are. I, you know, I've been in fights where, where my eye socket, my cheekbone, my my hand, and my ankle, all in one fight, smashed to bits. I were actually, you know, half my face were caved in, and um, that actually got me more recognition in that fight than me knocking someone out in nine seconds. I'm like, all right, I'll uh, <laughs> I'll go in my fight next time and get my face punched in, shall I? <laughs> Is that that's quite serious though, isn't it? Yeah, you know, well, looking at I, you now, I, I, I were having, um, I were, I were having knockouts in like nine seconds, seven seconds. I was just going in and blitzing them, and I was loving it. Me, I'm like, oh, I'm getting paid by second here, so loving it. You know, I was loving that. And then I go into a really hard fight, and it'd be a proper brawl, and I'd have my face, you know, I'd be smeared in blood. Actually, it's like someone poured a bucket over my head with, with blood. I was covered in blood. Like I say, half my face were all smashed in my cheekbone, my eye socket were just caved in, half my face were just black and blue, blood spilling, big gash under my chin. Um, and they loved it, the crowd loved it, you know, and I was getting more recognition for that fight than my nine second knockouts. I'm like, oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get it, but okay. But just on a, on a personal, is that something that you ever worry about or concerned about? I can nah, take it. No, I, I, I again, know, but. I knew what sort of guy I was. From a young age, at 16 year old, I was knocking grown men out for fun. You know, and I, I don't condone it, and I don't think we should all do it. But that's just how I that's grew up. up in. Uh, I grew up in that. You know, that time, I knew I were good at one thing, and that were fighting. What I didn't know is what I could take. I knew what I could give because I was always giving it to people, and I was I was damn good at it. 
And you, but you never know what you can take until you've been in a situation where you've got to dig deep and the other guy's just as good as you, or if not better than you, and you've got to dig deep and dig deep. And I never knew it until probably that that fight where I had my face smashed in. The fight happened, it was in Newcastle. Um, the guy was about a stone or two heavier than me. You know, a big, big, you know, a big lad. And um, I broke my ankle in the first 30 seconds at fight. I'd gone in to give him a right hook. He went in to give me a right hook. He connected first. But because I was swinging and he cracked me, I like corkscrewed down as I was going down, but my ankle stayed exactly the same place as I corkscrewed down. So I had two breaks, one chip and a fratch, and a, a torn ligament all on my ankle. It, it was... It was literally just flopping with my ankle, but I had my boxing boots on, so they were tight. So as I stood up, it still had a little bit of support, but as soon as I moved, I was going over in it. Mm. I kept going over, I kept going over. <clears throat> all through the fight, I just couldn't I couldn't stand up. I was going. Now, the referee thought I were on wobbly legs, okay, yeah. but it wasn't. It was, my, it was just my ankle. I carried on for another two rounds. It broke my cheekbone, my eye socket. It split my chin clean open. Um, I broke my left hand. I think I cracked a couple of ribs as well. I just literally got a beat in for two rounds, but I kept giving him it, and I nearly knocked him out. End of round one as well. I caught him. I don't. I don't know. How I stumbled towards him with one leg, but I just like hopped it over one leg and I give did him you, a right did you hook. Not think of pulling out of the fight. No, nah, it's it's not in me. I just I, again. I know the the sort of fighter I am. I'm not like the most skilled boxer. You know, I'm not. I'm not one of them hit and run, hit and move kind of guys. I'm mm. I'm a brawler. I get stuck in. I want to know what you've got. And what I can take, and then you're going to try and take what I've got. Mm. I, I like that, and I think that's what most people like to see: two guys just going toe to toe, you know, just like two bulls ramming each other in middle of the ring and seeing who, you know, seeing last man standing is. I think that's the more f- public what you know they like to see. Public like to see that sort of fight rather than let's see who can jab and move and jab and move. I'm not. It bores me that crap, if I'm honest. Right. But I, I appreciate the skill and how fit they are. Yeah. But that's not a proper fight. Um, obviously, you've you've boxed as well as 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 we mentioned about your your mm. time in the army. Um, can you just describe sort of the difference between taking a shot uh, with boxing gloves and and, and bare knuckle? Um, one hurts more than other. We <laughs> <laughs> um, we boxing with a boxing glove. There's no pain. You know, mm. there's well, this is me anyway. I don't I don't know about most people, but there's no pain. It, it's cushioned. Your your head rattles a little bit and you can get a little bit dizzy, but there's no actual pain to it. You know, there's no sharp shock. It's just a fud and your head might shake a little bit, and that's about it. But getting hit with a bare knuckle, it's 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 pain. Absolutely, it's just bone on bone, and you know you've been hit every single punch, whether it's a jab, cross. You know you've been hit with a bare knuckle. Mm. So there's a there's a massive difference, absolute massive difference. Not only that, it's the cuts. Like we in bare knuckle after our fight, pretty much all of us were covered in blood, because the skin opens up. You know, bone on bone, it just rips sle- rips flesh, mm. so we're cut open a lot easier. Now, these cuts will look worse after a fight, but a week later when them cuts have healed, we're back to normal. Yeah. But the main thing is, as brains not taking that shock, whereas with a glove, you, your brain, you know, you can take fifty punches with a glove. And you're still standing on your feet, you know. But in that 50 punches, your brain's being rattled. So although you're not really bad after a fight in boxing, in terms of cuts, and in, t- in terms of um, your brain damage later on in life, it really affects you. That's why people get punch, punch drunk, um, you know, when they retire from boxing. So being hit 50 times with a boxing glove is actually more dangerous in the long run than being hit three times with your face split open with a bare knuckle. Mm. Not only that, with bare knuckle, if you're hurt. You will, you get knocked out, you know. Whereas in boxing, the what your chances are, you'll just keep taking them and keep taking them and keep taking them, and that's more dangerous because your brain's getting rattled and brain's shaking inside your head. Mm. Whereas in bare knuckle, you'll just get knocked out and you come round. You might have a cut, your cut heals, but you you can't you can't heal your brain once you've had that damage done to it. Yeah, I was I was interviewing um, Dean Smudger Smith. I'm not sure if you've yeah, heard, yeah, heard of him. Yeah. yeah, I was interviewing him obviously um, for this assignment, and he said pretty much a replica of, of what you've just said then yeah. about um, you get sort of more concussion injuries and, and all those types of things in boxing whereas the injuries in uh, bare knuckle are sort of very aesthetic you know it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's on outside is, is bare knuckle you know all, all the, it looks worse because there's blood and that's that's all it is it's a cut what's pouring out with blood that's it it, look, it does look worse and people love the look of it but 
like you watch I, I've, I've had my face absolutely smashed to bits you watch me on a Saturday night after my fight and I'm covered in I'm black and blue and I'm covered in cuts and bruises and blood you watch me the following Saturday and I'll just have a couple of cuts there'll be a little black eye or it'll be, it'll be even yellow by the week later because I heal pretty good but again it's because it's on outside so we, we heal very good although a day or two after this fight we look a mess but a week or two later, you can't even tell. Mm. You know, I, th- I think I've done all right. I've been doing this 10 years and I don't look too yeah, bad. I can't, I can't, I can't <laughs> believe it looking at you now. Well, I've had, like I say, I've had big gash under there. I've had a gash over my eye, gash over my eyebrows, fractured cheekbone, gash under there, gashes under there. But you can't really tell unless I'm pointing them out to you. Yeah, that that's that was your chin and your, yeah. uh, just sort of below your eye, just for the radio. Yeah. But yeah. Um, you can't, unless yeah. I point them out to you, you can't see them. Mm. So I think I've I've done I've done all right, but I and I have actually had the, some of the worst injuries in bare knuckle as well. Mm. I think my hands are a mess though. My hands are a, it looks like someone's hammered them with hammers. And I got knuckle knuckle there knuckle there. That's bent as a banana. That I don't even know where that knuckle is. There. I think it's halfway up my arm. Fingers won't straighten. Finger won't straighten. And then that knuckle there. Look. Ah uh, yeah, it's not. This isn't great for radio, but no, the the, the knuckle is just sort of. Implanted into it, it'd be it's like sticking halfway up my arm, isn't it? I might take a photo of I'll let my, you take, yeah. well, my hand and your hand after 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 we finish. But Same with them, and all, like all scars. It's is that is that painful? Um, in cold, it is. You know, when we get winter, because it's like um, I think I've got arthritis now. Because as soon as cold weather comes, my hands are in agony. Right. But in warm weather, it's quite nice. It's like a soothing when yeah. warm weather, but know. they do look like um, you know, my girlfriend's holding my hand and she's stroking it and. She, yeah, yeah, she's like going over knuckles and they're popping up in places they shouldn't be. Oh. And <laughs> I know I, I'm thinking, what are you thinking in your head? Because I know that's not like <laughs> a normal hand. What you should be used to. Oh. Um, obviously, we mentioned we were talking sort of about the the safety, of the spot, and that type of thing. What's uh, for your sort of uh, the fights that are on these sort of arena shows and those types of things, the licensed shows? What sort of the the safety measurements in terms of uh, sort of post fight and pre fight medicals and all and all those types of things? It's just as good, if not better, than an average unlicensed boxing match. You know your white collar or your average MMA shows. Uh, again, I've been I've been on them all. I've been to them all, and the medics are just as good, if not better, because we've got higher regulations and we we watched a little bit closer. You know, because we still are a gri- that grey area, aren't we? Where mm. you know, is it illegal? Isn't it illegal? You know, people don't know, so we we know we're still getting watched that extra care, you know, extra bit more. So we've got to make sure we've got that, you know, that little bit more than your average person. But the medical is exactly, you know, exactly the same as a unlicensed or white collar boxing show, without a doubt. And I'll I'll go from a pre medical check. They'll do my heart rate, my blood pressure, um, ask questions, uh, obviously check your eyes, do, check your hands. Do all that lot. Yeah, and then after after a fight, it's exactly the same. They check you over. We had one medic called Bill Ellis, and I can't praise this man as much. You know, I I believe he's the best in country. He always after the fights, he'd be ringing me up, asking how I am, messaging me. Have I been at doctors over that look? You know, if there were a little cut, did you get that checked up? Like I told you, I get it checked. Always keeping on my case, always on his case, and it wasn't just me; it was all the other fighters as well. He 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 had a passion for our sport as just like we did, and he wanted to see it big, and he didn't want no slip ups on his side. So he were a very very, you know, particular that guy, and he just wanted it all done properly. Mm. Always checking up on us. So you want personally, you wouldn't. Sort of call for more right, uh, more safety, me- or you know, well, how, how do you sort of assess um, the medi- medical know, side and safety? I don't know side? what else we could do. Um, Obviously, in boxing, they think you've got to have like licenses and uh, annual medicals and head scans and that type of thing. Is yeah, that- we, uh, you could bring them in. Um, you could bring. Uh, Obviously, it comes down to a cost, doesn't it? Yeah, well, again, promote. That. You know, if, if you're under contract with a promoter, they should be paying for it. Um, not going to pay it out of my own pocket. That we, you know. If you promote once you want sure, then he's got to yeah. fa- abide by certain rules. But yeah, maybe you know, brain scan once every year or once every few years or something like that. Um, you know, getting an independent doctor as well. You know, going for a medical at an hospital, getting checked out, and going, look, that's for twelve months. You know, getting checked out, then you've got a license for twelve months. You know, to fight something like that. Maybe 
maybe something like that. But you, I suppose you can't have too many. Uh, you can't have um, enough regulations. You know, the, yeah. the more regulations, you know, the health that is safer it is for fighters. But I think the most dangerous part of any fight is dehydration. Yeah, you know, it's not the injuries. The injuries. I don't believe anyone's really ever properly died from injuries in a fight. It's always dehydration, which swells a brain. And that's from fighters making weight, yeah, isn't it? That's, yeah, that's from cutting weight, you know. You, you look at heavyweights. How many heavyweights have ever died in a ring? I, you know, I don't know any at the top of my head because they never have to cut weight, mm. you know. And they've taken, they've taken some serious beatings, you mm. know, the, the brains have been swelled. But the actual brain itself's not swelled because of dehydration. It's always lighter fighters always been lighter fighters it's because they're stripping the body and dropping all the you know the fluid from the body and they're just dehydrated so when they're in a fight and then they, they're getting the brain whacked all over because they're getting punched a thousand times as a, mm. these by these light fighters because they can do that because they're faster you know your brain getting punched a thousand times then it will swell and because, because there's no fluid in your brain and that's how you get blood clots and brain brain bleeds and all sorts and mm. um, what sort of reaction have you had sort of from people from maybe the boxing community or the MMA community do you is it at first we, were, we used to get a bit of um not a bit of stick but a bit we were frowned upon you know yeah. like kickboxers MMA guys and stuff like that and and pro boxers like oh, I'll never go anywhere you'll never you know you just all failed boxers mm. you know what are doing it oh I'm not a failed boxer because I don't really I only box in army I've, I never went pro or all like that I was just a tough guy, and I, I still am. But they, they'd they looked at it and they frowned upon us. But now, pretty much most of them lot are all having a go at it now. All ex-world kick, uh, kickboxing champions, UFC guys are coming over. Oh, you know, we've had Joe Riggs, we've had Melvin Gillard, um, what's it, Julian Lane. We've had loads of UFC guys coming over, doing bare knuckle now. You know, so we're doing something right. Mm. Same with you know ex world champion boxers, ex world champion kickboxers. We've got to be doing something right because they're all having a crack at it. Yeah. Um, just one question I forgot to ask, just about making weight. Is that is that something that you've got to do for your fights? And how, how I don't. I don't need to. I, I fight guys bigger than me, so right. I'm all right, <laughs> and I won't put myself through it. Right. Okay. I won't put myself. I won't dehydrate myself because again, when you're dehydrating yourself, you try to get your advantage over your opponent. You try to be bigger. Th- so on the night, you're going to be bigger than them, yeah. heavier than them. Yeah. Well. My my thing is weight does that should have no effect in a fight. It, uh, what uh, you're not using weight as an advantage unless you're leaning on you know unless you unless you're sat leaning them all the way through fight. It's your hands and your brain what's doing the fighting. So you being heavier than a guy, oh I don't really care. But surely is it not dangerous if you, if you are fighting someone that's ten fifteen pounds heavier than you? I've, and... I thought guys were three stone heavier than me, and I've knocked pretty much all of them out. Right. So again. W- being a heavier guy doesn't mean you hit harder. No, no. So I, I, I'm one of the hardest hitters in bare knuckle. I've, you know, I've got some of the best knockouts. I, I, I hit like a ton of bricks. I walk around at 13 and a half stone. And I, and I hit better than any heavyweight out there. So to me, just because you carry more weight doesn't mean you hit harder. It definitely doesn't mean you hit faster either. Because if you're carrying weight, you're yeah, not, yeah, not going to be as fast. So being weight heavier doesn't mean out to me what I believe should be regulated is maybe height that's that right. should be a, that, that's a disadvantage because they're saying that if you're heavier than your opponent then you, you've got an advantage well what about being taller then because mm. the other guy can't even get to you so you've got an advantage then but they don't do that they don't bring that into effect no. so if a guy's six foot four fighting a five foot eight guy well the, the six foot four's got an advantage a clear advantage because the other guy can't get close whereas a fat guy fighting a slim guy his only advantage is his weight. What's it? He's not having a sumo match. It's not sitting on him, so his weight shouldn't really mm. have an effect. I think so. Weight never bothers me. I'll fight any guy any weight. That never bothers me. So I don't mind fighting guys a couple of stone heavier than me. So I don't have to cut weight. So you've never you've never had to make weight for a fight, just to clarify. Um, yeah. I think I, I I did it one. I think I cut down to one one of them. I think I fought a twelve stone. Right, so I just I lost a bit of weight. I just trained a little bit harder. That was it. Yeah, I, I won't it's cut not, weight. It I won't, not, I won't yeah, actually yeah. dehydrate yeah. myself. I'll just do a little bit more cardio and burn actually burn fat rather than fluid. Because mm. that's what that's what most of them do. They're, just, they're taking fluid from the body to make weight. You're not actually burning fat unless you're obviously exercising. That's the only way. Healthy and exercising is the only way you can burn fat. Mm. 
So I'll just burn fat and do it over a little bit longer to that time. Yeah. Um, obviously, one of the other things I'm looking at is sort of um, how commercially successful the sport is and, and that type of thing. In terms of yourself, are you, are you um, speaking to Dean, he was signed to BKB. Uh, on, I think it was on a, on a two-year deal or something like yeah. that. Uh, are you? Are you? A, a I, well, I used to be signed to them. Um, right. I, again, I, I won't, our original ones to started all that company off. Yeah. Well, I helped build the company. Um, I want the first guys to ever get a contract with them. I've, I think I had three different contracts with them, um, and it got to right, last year. Might be last year. Right. My contract were running out, and they give me a three-year contract to sign again. But they won't pay me for it, for this contract. So I won't get paid for the co- for what the what they were saying is. Sorry, sorry, man. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Um, so what they were saying is, we'll give you a contract, and we'll give you the minimum of three fights a year for three years. So I, I looked at, it, I thought, if I don't sign it, I can have as many fights as I want with yeah. other companies. Right. You're only giving me free. You're not actually giving me any money. You know, like if a boxer when he goes and signs a contract, you, you know, you sign with us, we'll give you ten million if you sign with us. Well, I won't get no money for that. So, I'm like, well, what I'll do is I'll stay a free agent. You know, if you want me on show, I'm here. Mm. If you don't want me on show, there's other shows. So um, at that point, because I'd created a big enough name for myself and I were in demand and there were that many shows popping up now, I were in that position where I could go. I don't need to sign a contract with you. So I didn't sign a contract, which they spat the dummy out a little bit with me. You know, for not signing, saying, you know, we've been there together, for, you know, from the beginning, we've built this up. I'm like, yeah, but I'm not gaining all. You're telling me that I'm only allowed three fights a year. Well, I'm lazy. In between them fights, I'll get lazy, man, I'll put weight on. I need to fight every few months, mm. you know, co- continuously. And at the time, I was they didn't have a fight lined up for me for six months. So I took a fight in between that six months. So I'd, I were a free, co- I were a free agent. Mm. So I took a, uh, a fight. Um, before this, the, ne- the my next fight, and they kicked off over and saying I can't do it. I'm like, I can. I'm a free agent. I'll take. Any- you haven't got a fight lined up for me now. I need a fight to stay active. Otherwise, I'm going to get rusty and I'm going to get lazy. I need a fight in between the n- now and six months. Simple as that. Otherwise, I'm going to I'm going to put weight on and I'm going to be lazy mm. and I'm going to be rusty. Um, so I took a fight and they spat the dummy out and. Yeah. Were you Were you disappointed at that sort of like you said you were sort of one of the. The first few, first few fights to sign with them. Was I want to point that cause, you know business is business, and I, I told the, the there were two promoters, and one of the main promoter Joe, me and him were very close. You know, we were very again. I, I, I was there from the beginning with him. I was his poster boy. Every time he wanted interviews doing, I wasn't getting sent out and doing yeah. his interviews. I was the poster boy because. When I first got into this, it was full of, you know, big six foot odd, 19 stone guys with scars all over, flat noses, cauliflower ears. And then I rolled in with highlights, blonde hair, blue eyes, you know, and that's why they took me out of me. And he actually, he actually gave me the, the nickname Pretty Boy. Yeah. It was like a voting thing. And um, they wanted to push me forward saying, look, it's not just all these big, tough, rough looking guys. You know, if you've got the talent, anyone can do this. You know, it's it's whether you want to do it. So they were pushing me forward to be poster boy, and um, I, I did everything I can, and I think I did it, did the sport. I one of the main ones without a doubt to push the sport forward, mm. and being on TV so much and being on so many interviews and magazines, I think I did sport well. Them, them falling out with me over that, it's just business. I don't take it personal. Yeah, I know it's got a little bit personal after. And, Few little digs in, a few yeah. little sly things there. From but again, I don't take things for personal. Me, how, how have you found life as a, a free agent? Then I'm loving it. I, I've got fights galore. I've got like, there's too many fights. I, I can't even take them. There's you know there's fights running into each other. I had three fights in the last three weeks all lined up. You know after each other, and I just I couldn't do them because they're too close. And you don't know what sort of injuries they are. So I'm, I've got offers come, uh, to fight in America. I've got three offers to fight in America. Um, I've got title fights. Just coming out of me here now, so it's it's benefited me mm. without a doubt. I know their shows are a little bit more professional. Yeah, I was just going to ask because I know sort of researching this, the the big one that sold one hundred and fifty thousand pay per views. I think it was was a BKFC. Was it was it those that offered over you in fun? America? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, okay, all right. Yeah, wow. they're, they're doing they're doing good then. Yeah. Um, I think. 
David Fieldman, he runs that one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's mm. Bobby Gunn's um, manager and business partner. Um, there's there's another one in America. What's that called? I can't remember what that's called. Been in contact with them, and obviously Corey Williams show in America as well. I could fight on 27th of April, but I've already got a fight over here on 27th of April for heavyweight um, British bare knuckle title. Right. So he's trying to get me to pull out of my British heavyweight title fight to go and fight in America. Mm. Uh, have you ever I, fought in America before? No, but I fought Americans. I fought a f- right, few, yeah, yeah, a few yeah. Americans have come over to fight me, but I've not gone over to America. So would you like to do that? Just for well, the it's, it's on cards now. We're, do, we're, doing, we're doing a deal now. Ah, okay. Yeah, we're All doing right. a deal now. Is that like I says? He's offered me the the twenty seventh of April, but I can't take that. Um, but I said I'll take the one in. Ju- uh, I don't know if it's June or July. I think it's July. The one after that. Yeah. So I says right. I'll, I'll go to that one. But yeah, I'll, I'll go all over. I fought. I fought, I fought Italians. Scottish, Irish, Welsh, Americans. What else have I fought from all over me? <laughs> I'll come from all over. Try and beat me up. <laughs> <laughs> um, just in terms of sort of the general sort of perception of the sport, wh- where do you sort of see see that at the minute? Do you feel, do you feel that that's something that can ever sort of be bridged? I know we talk spoke about it in the ma- going into the mainstream, and you obviously mentioned the UFC. But do you think there's a certain sort of yeah well, stig- stigma that's gonna gonna no. always be there? Um, the the only thing I'll, I I I'm not again I'm not slagging BKB off because again it's it's my baby just as much yeah. as everyone else's because I helped create that you know company but I think they're going a little for my liking anyway a little bit too much like boxing the yeah. the basically it's just a boxing match without gloves <clears throat> now yeah that's that's good but we know the boss, best boxers are are out there and it's not them lot it's the ones what are on TV so we know the best boxers are what we want to see is who's the toughest. Who's the hardest? Who's who? Who's got more heart? That's what bare knuckles about, you know, and that's what my style of fighting is. But my style of fighting to them, you know, getting in there and getting stuck in and getting a little bit dirty. The, they're using boxing referees, and they're always they're yeah. stopping us too much. And you're like, well, you just let me have a fight. Just get out of way and there's, stay in the corner yeah. or something. And let me there's have a fight. Ex boxers as well going in there. Yeah. Tyler Good, John Curtis Woodhouse have both. Yeah, got, got ex- exactly. Yeah. Recently, so. And they'll they'll they're trying to have a boxing match. And you're like, just have a fight, mate. Come on, stop being a pussy and running away. <laughs> just want to fight me. You know, back in days when Lenny McLean and Roy Shaw used to do it. You know, they were just hard men. Mm. It was actually Roy Shaw's son what voted for my nickname, Pretty Boy. Oh, right. So obviously Roy Shaw were known as Pretty Boy. Mm. And um, when this whole thing for voting for my name came about, I was supposed to pick it because at the time I didn't have a fight name and I was knocking everyone out. And I was, like I say, well, I think I'm the number one contender in the country. And um, I didn't have a nickname. And so they, they were like, let's vote you know, for a nickname for you. I was like, don't want one, really. You just call me Scott. My mum calls me Scott. <laughs> you know, if it's good enough for my mum, it's good enough for everyone else. But um, I agreed to it anyway. I said, oh, then I'll pick it. So the winner... Whatever I picked, the, the winner of what name got like four free tickets to the next show, something, something silly like that, I can't remember. But um, I was working on doors. Oh, yeah, what are I, Bingley or. I might, have been in, I might have been working on doors in Bingley and I couldn't get home in time to go on Facebook to. Because I couldn't be doing it while I'm working, yeah. while I'm at work. So I, I messaged promoter. I said, look, you're going to have to pick it because it had to be picked before 12 o'clock at night. I said, look, you're going to have to pick it. But do us a favour, mate. I went, pick a fucking mean one. I went, oh, you know, <laughs> I says, everyone's already taking Mick calling me boy band, One Direction, Boy Zone, yeah. you know. I'm having an absolute, you know, rip yeah, taken yeah, out yeah. of me. I says, just, you know, pick a proper mean one. And there were one that kept prop- popping up, which I loved. It was Bradford Brawler. I'm a brawler, I'm a fight, you know, I'm a proper... F- uh, but my idol is Jack Dempsey. Okay. You know, Jack Dempsey from, you know, he won title in 1919. Mm. And his nickname, what Manasseh Manasse Mauler, we're from Manasseh, and his, you know, he was a Mauler, and yeah, that's what he used yeah, to do. Yeah. And I'm from Bradford, and I'm a brawler. I thought, oh, fuck, I'd love that. I, 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 I w- Got something a bit yeah, different. Yeah, <laughs> I, lo- I loved the nickname, and I was like hinting, you know, I like so and so's comment, you know, and I was hinting loads of times. I was like, come on, Joe, pick that one. And I came home, and he'd picked a pretty boy, and I did a big statement. He was like, <laughs> 200 letters long I says look out of respect for F- Roy Shaw I can't have that name you know I could have a thousand fights undefeated and I'll always be in that man's shadow he's, he's one of the first real tough men in the country so, you know him and Roy, uh, him and Lenny McLean are the, you know they, they are real tough guys 
So I says, out of, Roy, out of respect for Roy Shaw, because he was known as Pretty Boy, I says, I, I can't have that name. And then bloody Roy Shaw's son, Gary, came on, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> and he, he says, I've actually voted for that name for you. He um. says, look, he says, I'll tell you the truth. He says, when they, when they picked that for my dad, it would a piss take. And it says that, you know, they took the piss out of my dad because he was a mean looking guy and Pretty Boy was not what he was. It says, but with you, you know, he says, you're a good looking lad. He says, and it just suits you. So I don't think you'll be in the same categories, you know, of living in the shadow of my dad. He says, I think, it's, you know, it's going to stick with you. And cost Gary, who was a good mate of mine, he picked it. I'm like, bloody hell, I can't, I can't go wrong. <laughs> can't so that having that Roy is. Shaw's family, you know, say, look, we want you to have it. Mm. And like passing, you know, torch on, want it. And um, well, I'll tell you a story about that. I went to a fight once in Coventry and Gary Shaw were having his first bare knuckle fight. So right. he was trying to follow in his dad's footsepts. Yeah. Although he was he knocking on now, but he were, this was his first bare knuckle fight. And he fought a kid called um, Isaac Gypsy Kid, uh, Gypsy kid Gibbs, who were a, tra a travelling lad. And it was a great fight, an absolute great fight. Went distance and Gary lost on points. And because I'd just be been given nickname Pretty Boy, I then went up to um, Gypsy Kid. I said, right, I says, fought Roy, for Roy Sean, I fought Pretty Boy nickname. I said, you got to fight me next. And then I ended up fighting him and beating him in one round. So like, I kind of got the... Got the one up on yeah. him. Yeah. He beat, obviously, Roy's son. So, because I'm currying Roy's nickname, I had to beat him. So I, <laughs> I beat him in one round. Um, just finally, I just wanted to sort of just describe sort of the mindset of a, of a bare knuckle fighter and what, what sort of what 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 attributes do you need sort of to be to be a bare knuckle fighter and what what sort of goes through your head you know game you, you got to be game you you know you can't you can't be having nerves I I don't think I never get ner nervous in a fight it's a fight fighting to me is like you making a sandwich you know it's just a fight to me I I love it but you've I believe I've lost it this last year uh, a little bit in. Um, Every fight I want before before this last year, every fight I wanted to annihilate my opponent. I, just, I wanted to give him such a bad beating that if someone ever said my name, he gets shivers. You know, just remembering the beating I give him. But this last year I've got a little bit lazy and a little bit too friendly. Too nice. Um, so I think what you've got to, I think the main thing is as a bare knuckle fighter, you've got to be game. You've got to be willing to fight anyone, anytime, any place, anywhere. You've got to, you don't have fears. Because if you've got fears, then what's the point of being there? Because you, you're fighting the hardest guys in country. Simple as that. I fight the hardest guys around the world. So if I've, if there's any sort of fear in me, well, I'm not already, I'm already not going to give me 100%. If I've got some sort of doubt or some sort of fear, then I'm not going to give me 100%. But if I'm confident, I go, look, when I hit you, you're going to know you've been hit. And I go in and give him it. It's different. So you, you, I think gameness, like taking a beating, you've got to be able to take a beating. It's all right being the best boxer in the world and giving someone a beating, but you've got to be able to take it. I think that's why I was so good, because I, I, I finally found out just how tough I was. I was just as tough as what I could give it, which made me, you know, a, a damn good bare knuckle fighter. So it's all right, me being able to give someone it, but you've got to be able to take it. And then when you're taking it, so if someone's giving you a, a good beating, you've been beaten up for three or four rounds and he's absolutely giving you everything, and you still stood there smiling, covered in blood, walking forward, swing punches, his heart will start going, because he's like, what can I do to stop this guy? And he'll start thinking then, shit, I don't, I don't know how to stop this guy. And that's when you see people who don't have hearts, they start shrinking and they're going, oh, crap, I don't want to be here anymore. Mm. So you've got to be able to just go. Just, it's gameness, just gameness. Don't stop until the fight's over. Simple as that. Whether you win, they win, or referee stops it, just don't stop fighting. Mm. Is that what's going through your head when, when you're in the fight? It is, uh, although this last few year, this last year, I don't know, I've just got, a bit, like I say, I've got right mellow. Is that well, it? Is that just with age? Or I anything? think, no, I've been put, I've been really ill. Yeah. Um, I, re I, I, didn't know I, I didn't know I were ill until a few weeks ago, but I've had it for months and months and months now. I don't know, I could have had it for last year or two, I don't know. Um, I've had this um, bacteria bug in my stomach that's just been eating away at me and lying in. I've been throwing up, getting shakes, bad stomach pains, co you know, chronic stomach pains. I've just not been myself. And I've always, it's just, I've been thinking about it all day long. I'm thinking about, am I, am I going to get pains in my stomach? You know, am I mm. going to get, I was crossing road, uh, went to Amsterdam of a weekend. I was crossing road and I just got really faint headed and I, I nearly got run over because I was getting shakes. I couldn't see properly. And then um, I went to doctors that day and they went, oh, we've been trying to get in touch with you. Your bloods have come back and you're still sample. And then I said, that's when they told me what I had. 
So I think this last year I've just not been myself, but I'll get back to myself and I'll get back to. I just I want that. Like two years ago, I had a killer instinct. I just wanted to hurt whoever were in that ring with me or whoever were in them, them hair bales. I wanted to hurt them. And I think I lost that a little bit. And you, ca you can't really lose it. You shouldn't lose that in a fight. You should always have that. Mm. Otherwise, you might get your ass kicked. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned just about the only Sorry to sort of drag this on. But do, um, do you think, is that through a career of bare knuckle boxing? Or no, no, that not through bare knuckle boxing. Right. It's... Um, just a contagious bug what I've caught right. it's a bacteria bug what's got in my, it's in my stomach okay and um, so much triggered it I think to be honest drinking's triggered it right because um, if you drink too much then you can start throwing up and that's what I was started doing I was throwing up and once I've started throwing up I think it's triggered the bug one in three people have got this bug all in them all the time but it's never it's always dormant and something sometimes triggers it and then it just causes so much pain yeah, right. and that's what I've been I've been in chronic pain I was just about to end it, end it there, but that <laughs> doesn't seem like the best way to end it. What's next for you then, Scott? I've got a British heavyweight bare knuckle title fight on 27th of April. Um, I'm fighting, um, what's it called, Adam Lee. Pretty sure I'll knock him out in one round. What, where's that? Um, that's in Aldershot. Okay. Uh, down by my country. Um, so, yeah, I'm pretty sure I'll beat him. And then I've got... July the 27th for the light heavyweight bare knuckle title but we're trying to, I think we might be changing the rules or the fight itself because there's this new a new sport was just coming and you like a head, head butt <laughs> you know like a elbow you like a knee and you like a f um, sweep and throw to the floor right so they're, the bit, they're just turning it into a street fight and it's what's it called Lewinf Lewinf something like that it's actually a sport Oh well, I've, um, I've not heard of this. Really. Yeah, well, I've I've only found out about it a few months ago. And is this in the UK or in America? Yeah, we're having it in, in the UK. UK. Oh, well. um, again, because we're a lot, because we're getting, we've got bare knuckle sanction now. We can get as many rough sports as we can, as yeah. long as we've got rules. Which this this has got rules. Um, I'll tell you what, I'll get it up now. Yeah. Let's find out what it's called. And you you um you likened it to a street fight, didn't you? Well, yeah, the lad who's I'm fighting is a professional kickboxer. Okay. And he would up for it, he's like, oh, yeah, it's my, more my game. And I'm thinking, no, mate, it's more my game. <laughs> Trust me, I, you know, I'll have thrown a thousand times more headbutts than you. I'll have elbowed a hundred more people than you. So, although he's better with his feet than me. Let me just get it up. Posted last night, but what it were called? Right, and is this is this the first time it's happened, or is that's this? It. That's what it's called there. Left view here, whatever it is. Yeah, just uh, L. Ah, uh, yeah, it seems like sort of a foreign spell. Uh, L e L E T H W E I. Uh, yeah, all all punches, all elbows, all knees, all kicks, all throws, all sweeps, all headbutts. Yeah. So wow. it's, again, it's just a street fight to me and. Dave Lowe's. That yeah, that's, yeah. My, yeah, that's my mate. That's my mate. Fighting. Um, so we're trying to get our bare knuckle light heavyweight title fight the, with them rules. Yeah. Um, or or just that or just that fight itself. Obviously, he thinks his it's more his cup of tea because he's allowed to use kicks. But and when you get headbutted by me, you're gonna know about it. <laughs> <laughs> so again, it's, it's my bread and butter. Street fight is my bread and butter. You know, um, that's what they all use. They used to call me like a, a barroom brawler or a pub brawler. That's, the more dirty it is for me, the better I am. I'm, I'm just a savage in a street fight. Obviously, I'm trying to keep away from all that as I can now and never get into them because I've, I've got kids, I've got too much to lose. But it is still my bread and butter, and that is what I'm good at. I just want to show in front of the world a proper street fight <laughs> without getting locked up at the end of night. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, um, thanks for your time, Scott. Really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for coming down. Uh, really it, appreciate your Thank time. You. Thanks very much. Thanks very much.